Thank you, Mike. And good morning, Mesa Church of Christ. So great to be back with you all again. Seems like our weeks are flying by pretty quickly, huh? Already in October? Wow, crazy. Well, if you were with us for the first part of our Ephesians series, you remember that uh, in uh, chapter uh, 1, we, we noted that uh, we deserve the wrath of God, but, but because of who we are in Christ and because of His rich uh, mercy, we are made alive in Christ. Christ, even when we were dead in our transgressions, it is by grace that we have been saved. Uh, a couple of things I want to process with you as we think about these texts in chapter one, this, this Paul's clear message that we're in Christ, in chapter two, that we, we really deserve the wrath of God. But because of where we are, remember our history and remember our geography, where we've been and, and where we live in Jesus, everything has changed. But we also talked. Uh, particularly two weeks ago today, about these evil forces that are very much at work. And they're always whispering to us, always, um, you're not enough, or surely God didn't mean that, or any number of lies that they try to convince us to believe. Satan always wants us to believe his lies as opposed to God's truth. A few years back, I came across a series, um, a gentleman by the name of James Brian Smith wrote what's called the Good and Beautiful series, Good and Beautiful God, um, Good and Beautiful um, Community, um, the Good and Beautiful God Community, and there's one more, I can't remember, I've lost it, I've lost it now, Good and Beautiful uh, Faith, perhaps. Um, but in one of these books, he makes this pretty profound observation related to um, the, the truths that we believe, kingdom truths, or what he refers to as uh, false imperative narratives. False imperative narratives. If you look at that as an acronym, it's FINS, F-I-N-S, and it's like sharks <laughs> that just kind of swim around us all the time. And they're trying to convince us to believe something other than God's kingdom truths. And so I want to contrast with the, uh, these with you this morning and just take a look at this. Um, one of the false imperative narratives that he points out is, is that I am alone. But here's the kingdom narrative of God. You are never alone. Christ Jesus is always with you. Um, we have a tendency to believe sometimes that things always have to go as I want them to go. That's false narrative. The true kingdom narrative is Jesus is in control. Colossians 1, right? He basically is the glue that holds it all together. Something terrible will happen if I make a mistake. That's actually a false imperative narrative. Um, mistakes happen all the time. Usually things work out. And typically that's true, right? I mean, um, unless there's some massive trauma that just kind of derails everything. But even then, there's healing and there's hope in Christ Jesus. Life must always be fair and just. Smith says that's a false imperative narrative. The true narrative is life is not always fair and just, but God gets the last word. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I need to be perfect all the time. And the kingdom narrative is Jesus accepts me, and I'm not talking here about willful sin. That's in a different category. But as we strive to be obedient servants of Christ, we learn quickly that it is by grace that we have been saved, not by my own merit, not by my own doing, not by my own work, but by the work of Christ. And the text has been pretty clear on that. So one of the things that happens when we do church together is that we have these false imperative narratives that are in the same water. The fins, the sharks, are swimming in some of the same waters where we are also trying to hear the truth of the Lord, the life-giving truth of the Word of the Lord, the kingdom-giving truth of the Lord. And so many times we're, we're pulled. And you may or may not know, know this about Churches of Christ. Do you know that we've divided occasionally? Do you know that we've, you know that we've had our issues with kind of not agreeing sometimes? And, and sometimes we, we, we seem to kind of get 
get kind of angry with one another, and, and, and um, there's a, another false imperative narrative that we have embraced sometimes, and that is if we disagree, we must divide. And, and Paul is preaching the exact opposite. And he is encouraging churches to embrace the true narrative of kingdom, which is that you know, God, God wants us to be one in heart and body and, and mind. But even when we're not, even when we're not, just a question for you to consider this morning. May we not be of one heart even when we are not of one opinion? And I would hope the answer to that question would be yes. And I think as we dig into the text this morning, we're going to see some truths that come forward that God wants us to understand. Because what we see in Ephesians, I believe, what we see, I, I think it's the most powerful love story that's ever been, ever been told, ever, in the history of the human race. Now, you may or may not know this, we Americans love a good love story. Would you agree with that? We tend to really enjoy love stories. If you don't believe me, you remember when Titanic came out many years ago? Not the original, uh, but the movie, the Titanic, came out about, uh, you know, the one that, uh, what was the guy's name? The... Yeah, Jack. Yeah, that's it. The guy standing on the bow and, uh, yeah, and all that kind of stuff of the ship. And uh, Kate Winslet, I guess, was in that movie. When that movie came out, it made over $600 million domestically. It was the first movie to ever go over a billion dollars in total ticket sales. And that was just one love story among many that we, you know, have been experienced to in, in American cinema. Uh, the American Film Institute actually listed the top 10 love stories of all times. I'm not going to read this out. You can see the list here that's going to pop up on screen. Uh, some of these will be really familiar to you, some of these titles, uh, Casablanca being uh, at the top. Uh, some of these movies I've never seen. I don't know anything about them. I think most of them are quite a bit older. Uh, but these were, according to the American Film Institute, the, the greatest love stories that have ever been placed on the big silver screen. But today, I want to share a love story with you that we don't just sit and watch. Um, I want to share a love story with you that doesn't just tug at your emotions. Um, I want to share a love story with you that will change the way that you live. And I think we see that in Ephesians chapter 3. So let's dig into the text and see what we find. I'm going to start at verse 1. For this reason, I, Paul... A prisoner of Jesus Christ for the sake of you Gentiles. Surely you have heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. That is the mystery made known to me by revelation as I have already written briefly. In reading this then, you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to people in other generations as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets. This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and sharers together in the promise in Christ Jesus. He said, I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of his power. And although I am less than the least of all of the Lord's people, this grace was given to me to preach to the Gentiles the boundless riches of Christ and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery, which for ages past was kept hidden in God, who created all things. His intent was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms according to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. In him and through him, or faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. I ask you, therefore... Not to be discouraged because of my sufferings for you, which are your glory. For this reason, I kneel before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that through his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his Holy Spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you being rooted 
and established in love may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Chapter 3 begins with this phrase. For this reason, I, Paul. For this reason, I, Paul. And then it's like he is so excited about what he's going to say next. It takes him 13 verses before he gives us a verb that complements the subject of the sentence. We used this phrase uh, several years ago back in um, horse and buggy days when a horse is chomping at the bit. You, you've heard that phrase before, right? It's just ready to go, ready to, ready, to, ready to run the race, ready to get out there and do the work. Paul is so excited. He's just chomping at the bit here. He, he, he says in verse 2, God is so gracious to me. He continues, God revealed to me. That which has been hidden, it's no longer a secret. I'm telling you, I'm telling you now what it is. The gospel is for everyone. He's chumming at the bit here through the church's wisdom, uh, or through the church, God, God's wisdom will be made known to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly realms. Christ Jesus is king, Paul's going to say. Not them, not their false truths, not their false narratives, but the truth of Christ. I said earlier, we're not just passively watching the greatest love story ever told. We're part of it. We are part of the story. Christoph Friedrich Blumhart. Isn't that a great name? Christoph Friedrich Blumhart. He put this into perspective a few years back when he wrote, God has created us human beings to be dissatisfied with small things. We must learn to think cosmically. And I would say here, we got to think in the cosmic story of God. He says, cast off your chains if you can believe this and think cosmically. He wrote these words in 1899. 1899. And it, he's mining here, I think, the truth of Scripture. This is a big deal. <laughs> It's a big deal. It's an amazing story that we are part of. Paul doesn't just stop there. He continues through Jesus and through faith in Jesus, we can approach God with freedom and with confidence. Doesn't that sound, doesn't all of this sound like the story, the components of a great love story to you? Any of you, when, any of you spouses, when you pull into your driveway, do you tremble with fear when you get ready to walk into the house because you're not sure about what you're going to be facing? Oh my goodness, wouldn't that be miserable? Wouldn't that be awful? But how many of you, like my wife, when she pulls into our driveway, can't wait to come into the door to see me? <laughs> Doesn't that happen to you all? Or when I get back off from a trip, you know, and I run into the house and I hug her and I'm oh, sweetheart, it's so great to see. I mean, that's our normal, isn't that normal? Isn't that what you, I, I mean, you're shaking your head like this. That's good. That's good. You know, there's components of powerful love. And if we can get that and understand that in, 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 you know, at the human level, how much more profound is this love that we experience as sons and daughters of God, as brothers and sisters in Christ? In the Greek text, as you're looking at your Bibles there in Ephesians 3, in the Greek text, verses 14 through 19 is one long and very complicated sentence. Now, translators break it up so that we can understand it. And so you're going to see almost a, uh, some bullet points or a staccato type uh, approach to kind of breaking this prayer down. Um, but I want us to focus on the components that comprise this prayer uh, this morning. And if you can think about these components like links in a chain, links in a chain, 
I think that'll give you a good visual image of what we're anchored to, or perhaps even better said, who we are anchored to in Christ. So Paul has addressed his message, kind of a message within a message. And as we go all the way back to the beginning, now he finds his verb. (laughs) He says, since... Since you are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by His Spirit, verse 22, I am driven to my knees in prayer. And here are some of the elements of which he prays. He prays that the Lord will strengthen us with power. And of course, he's writing to the church at Ephesus, but he's he's also writing to the greater scope, followers of Jesus. I pray that God will strengthen you with power through His Spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Now, I want to tell you, it's really hard to find an English phrase that captures the essence of what the Greek text says here. So, I want to show you what it literally says. May He grant that through His Spirit you be fortified toward or into the inner being so that the Messiah may dwell in your hearts. So what does the word Messiah mean? Messiah is, do you know? The the anointed one or king. And if we want to get that succinct about it, the chosen one, the chosen one of God. I love F.F. Bruce's explanation of this verse. He notes, the inner being is the new creation inwardly brought about by the Spirit in those who are united by faith to Christ. It is renewed from day to day, even when the outer mortal nature wastes away. There's a permanency here that Paul is addressing, an eternal view of who we are in Christ I think some of the best insights we see about what this verse means is to note what Paul offers um, in 2 Corinthians 4, verses 16 through 18, when he writes, Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day, for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. And so we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. So Paul prays for this strengthening in the inner self, but he doesn't stop there. He prays also that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints. Now, I want you to notice words here that Paul doesn't use. I'm always intrigued by words that authors of Scripture use. I'm also intrigued by words that they don't use. And I want you to notice here what he doesn't use. He doesn't say, I pray that you will be rooted and established in legalism. He doesn't say, I pray that you will be rooted and established in possessions. Or that you will be rooted and established in cynicism or anger or suspicion, or envy, or jealousy. Rather, he prays that we will be rooted and established in what? Say it with me. Love. Love. If we attempt to have power outside of love, then it's not godly power. It's guilt-based power. Threat-based power. Conditional power. That's not God's power. So what's the ideal context in which this love is to be expressed? We are to be strengthened through this this love of God. What is the ideal context? He says, with all the saints. Specifically here, trying to build a bridge between Jews and Gentiles. Together as one, not because of the law, but because of who you are in Christ. Why? Why does Paul pray this? Notice verse 18. So that. So that. Here's why I'm praying this. So that. You grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. 
So what's the desired outcome of this inner being? This inner being that's been fortified and continues to be fortified in love. It's to grasp the fullness of God's love. And grasp in this prayer literally means to to comprehend, to, to acknowledge a fact. It's one of the greatest aha moments that we as believers can experience. Do you remember when you realized, those of you who are married, do you remember the moment you realized you were in love with this person? Do you remember? Do you remember that? It's that, oh, aha, aha, this is the one. This is the one. You realize that you're in love. In our case, when we grasp it, when we comprehend it, when we acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, the the fact that we realize is that we're loved by Jesus. Do we understand that? We are so loved by Jesus. Look back at verse 12. It helps us understand why we can approach him with freedom and confidence, right? Because that's the kind of love that Well, there is no other outcome that I could think of. (laughs) Freedom and confidence. Lloyd Stilley notes as he's writing on this text, agape love, which the Greek describes here, Paul uses in, in his text, is decision love. Decision love. That is, it is love that is fixed. It's not a fleeting emotion. It's not passion of the moment. This is love that is in the will. It's love that rises from the choice of the one loving. The cause that beckons forth agape is never found in the object of love, which is why translators of the Bible in past generations didn't use the word love typically to capture the essence of agape. Instead, the word they used was charity. Some of your older translations may have that word where we sometimes see love in the newer translations. And we don't use the word charity too often these days, uh, except maybe to refer to uh, folks uh, whose life circumstances have kind of put them in a hard spot. But have you ever heard somebody say when you offer them help, I don't need your charity? I don't need your charity. Uh, We might say that when we can't pay somebody back or we're getting something we didn't earn. But when it comes to the love of God, aren't we all kind of charity cases? Yeah. Paul continues in verse 19, I pray that you may know this love that surpasses all knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. And this is one of my favorite verses in all of Scripture. I pray that you know that which you cannot know. (laughs) Isn't that interesting? I pray you know what you can't know. And it's not a prayer that's offered to confuse. It's, It's offered to keep us focused on that which matters most to know love that is beyond reason. I can't, I can't put this together, that I could be loved that much. I can't comprehend the kind of love that somebody else would go to the cross for me and take my sin upon himself. The kind of love that's described here, this is turn the other cheek kind of love. This is pray for your enemies kind of love. This is don't tie heavy burdens on your brothers and sisters kind of love. This is uh, I can't believe you just did that in a good way kind of love. This is love that makes us feel full, not empty, not lonely, not isolated, not afraid, certainly not worthless. How do we keep this love growing within us? How do we remain rooted in it? And I think we do that by following a very, very subtle example here. Matter of fact, if you read through too quickly, you miss it. Paul's prayer begins and ends by glorifying God, the source of this love that he's describing here and the story that all of us are invited into. 
Something very fascinating about the movies that I shared with you earlier, the top 10 greatest love stories, uh, seven of them feature couples that do not end up together in the end. Isn't that interesting? Interesting. Um, going back to what Lloyd Stilley writes again, he says that as human beings, we, we all want to be swept away. We want to be loved in spite of ourselves. We want to be fully accepted, fully cherished. We want to matter to someone. We want to be caught in someone's arms when we fall. We want someone to watch over us. We want to experience a consummate love, to be enraptured in the lavish love of someone who knows the truth about us, but will not turn away. And here's the great news from Ephesians 3. Love like that is freely given to us in Christ. And that is the greatest love story ever told. It's the greatest love story ever told. So this week, I want to encourage you, please go back and read this passage over and over and over again. Think about the many false narratives that we tend to embrace and focus instead on the kingdom truth that calls you again and again and again into that deeper relationship with Jesus Christ, who is the Son of God. We're going to share a song together this morning, church. If there's anything that we can do to bless you in any way, I pray with you, to encourage you. If you want to be baptized this morning, what a phenomenal uh, time of celebration and praise that would be, to have your sins washed away, to be in that, that greatest love story ever told, that eternal love story that never fades. Whatever need is on your heart this morning, you can just make your way down to the front if you would like. We're going to stand together and we're going to sing this song of invitation.